Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. So today we are looking back to a webinar that was hosted by the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce in San Francisco Silicon Valley back in 2020. And on this webinar we had the pleasure to have author and journalist Lars Borinas with us where he presented some of the key insights from his book The Last Steps of Olof Palme Impressions of a Murderer. And we hope that this shortened version of the webinar will be as interesting for you as it was for us who was listening in. So let's get into the video. Well, thank you first for having me. I think it's really uh, very nice to be able to, to sit uh, with this uh, in this context and, and talk about my favorite issue, if I could say that as a journalist. <laughs> I've uh, covered many issues, but this is by far the one that has taken most time uh, and, uh, and uh, I've spent many hours, weeks, months, or even years with, with the Palma assassination because I feel it was such an important event. I mean, it was certainly, as, as far as I, I see it, it was the most uh, singular, most important event in Swedish interior politics in, in the latter half of, of the 19, 19, uh, the 20th century. So, uh, and I've covered it for uh, many years as a journalist. And yes, I will give a little background then for, for those who, who were not present or do, do not remember the, this period. Uh, Palmer was assassinated then in 1986. And the beginning of the 80s was very turbulent time in, in the world actually, because we had a cold war. And it was what could be called a second phase of the Cold War because the Reagan administration had uh, started an, uh, an offensive in the beginning of the 80s to uh, increase the armament, uh, the armament race and try to force the Soviet Union to uh, collapse, which they succeeded to do actually in the, by the end of the 80s. But uh, it was a very, uh, very tough tension between the two superpowers. And uh, Sweden as a neutral country and Olof Palme as a prime minister with very strong interest in international politics. He, uh, he played a part in this because he believed in disarmament and he was afraid, <laughs> he, he was afraid of this uh, nuclear race which was taking place. So he uh, had a, his own objective was, he called it the uh, common security which he, he felt was a better idea than an arms race. Uh, common security, that is that the, the uh, superpowers should talk to each other and, and uh, find compromises and so on. Uh, and he, he uh, worked for this very strongly uh, through initiatives. Uh, and, uh, and he was a prominent figure in international politics. But in uh, the US, uh, one didn't like that. Uh, because they, uh, it disturbed the strategy of, of the Reagan administration. I can just quote one thing which gives a picture of Olaf Palme's importance. I had made an interview in, in, uh, in the 90s with uh, the former Deputy States, uh, Secretary of State uh, of the United States, uh, Richard Burt. And he said to me in this interview, which I aired on television afterwards, Sweden without Palme, he said, became a more normal country. Governments in Sweden after Palme did no more try to get establish fundamental changes in the world. They bothered instead for what normal governments bother about, things that concern their interior problems and their neighbors. After Palme, Bert said, there was no more any Swedish global policy. And then I asked, was there no need for one? And Bert said, no, because it was the result of this one man and his intellect. So this gives you some idea of the, of the importance of Palme internationally, mm -hmm. but they saw him as a, a problem in, in, in Washington. So he had very strong enemies, not only in, in, in the United States, but also in other parts of the world. He was an activist. He was very strongly against the South African apartheid regime. He was actually leading the international criticism against the apartheid regime. Uh, and uh, he was working for a boycott of South Africa, which would have been possibly devastating to, to, to the country. He was very opposed, strongly opposed to the Pinochet, Pinochet regime in Chile. Uh, and he was not very well liked by Israel because he, was, uh, he had invited Yasser Arafat to Sweden and so on. So he, you could say he took risks 
but he uh, and so we had many enemies and he was certainly when he was killed it was very easy to imagine where where the idea and the initiative could have come from there were many different places but even in sweden he had a lot of uh, a lot of strong enemies i mean he was uh, he was polarizing like uh, in a way you can see the world is polarized now so it was like either people loved him or hated him um, that's true. More than any other politician in Sweden uh, ever, I would say, he he uh, was uh, a figure who was liked and disliked, and very strongly disliked by some. They even hated him uh, in the extreme right, but also within, for instance, the military. They saw him as a potential traitor because he was so lenient towards the Russians, as they saw it, uh, and within the secret service, SEPO, as it's called in Sweden. There was also suspicions that he actually that he was a traitor, that he was an agent for the Soviet Union. Uh, so he had very strong enemies and powerful enemies also in Sweden. So actually, the minefields that he was stepping on were not only international; they were also national. So when he was killed, one could say that uh, it was not. Uh, it was quite logical that that he was killed because he was involved in so many conflicts and had taken so many very difficult and, and dangerous positions. But still, we were we were all in, in shock, even if uh, it was logic. It was, I mean, nobody was expecting it, no, or at no, least not, not I. <laughs> no, on the contrary, it was seen as, as totally impossible. Uh, his friend, a friend of his, a journalist called uh, Dieter Strand, has told afterwards that when he heard about the news, he asked, he heard that Palma had been shot. He said, where was he? Was he in New York or in Tehran? No, it was in Stockholm. And he couldn't believe it. In Stockholm. It's not possible. And this was a feeling we had in Sweden. This was not possible. It couldn't happen here, actually. It, it couldn't it happen. And it was also a time when you had a prime minister walk. He asked his bodyguards to go on a movie theater uh, without his security guards uh, alone with his wife on, on a Friday night uh, walking home. Uh, that, that's also, it seems so, it was, it, it changed, it, it could never happen after that. Uh, maybe Lars Johansson, you, you, your word from that, you were a young teenager then, uh, or old teenager. Yeah, uh, I, I will say I was an old teenager <laughs> <laughs> at the end of it, but no, I, I mean, I, I was shocked as well. I, I remember to this day, my, my mother came home and, uh, uh, and with a newspaper. And, and uh, I think for many days, you, you felt very uncomfortable. It, it was, in my mind, it was similar to 9-11, where you felt the discomfort, even though, you know, I was an hour away from Stockholm, that uh, it, it became very personal. Uh, and I think for, and for a long time, it... it uh, it changed. Uh, I remember when we went to Stockholm with a school class uh, in, in the Swedish high school and, and uh, the class met Olof Palme <clears throat> in the Gallerian, uh, the big shopping mall. And uh, it was just a different, it was a very open and peaceful society. I, th I think we felt very shocked, all of us. I also remember, I mean, I think in, in the book you, you, you mentioned that Olof Palme, he lived and he moved to central Stockholm in 83. and. Uh, in the early 80s, he lived in a in a small house in Vällingby, and and there was kind of, everybody knew it. We when 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 we passed there, it was several times a week. Often you could know that that, that lives all of Palme, and it was just you could walk into his garden. It was like it was it was so small uh, society that it just it was it was amazing. So let's dig into the what what, what happened then, and and uh, and a little bit the the theories you have in the book. So in the in the, in the book you have taken a, a little different angle uh, than uh, many many books or, or investigations have, have done, and you've gone back to the the, the crime scene and uh, looked very narrowly and what happened at the crime scene, and also uh, all of uh, all of Palmer's wife's Lisbeth Palmer's uh, involvement uh, in, in or not involvement, but how she has been uh, treated and how she has been behaving during this uh, investigation, which, which raises many questions. Uh, 
Yes, it's it's really very uh, strange and could possibly be very important what happened uh, already in the morning. Uh, I come back to this map in a little while, but uh, Palmer in the morning, Palmer went to the play tennis with a friend and he had his bodyguards with him because he was supposed to have his bodyguards with him when he was uh, far away from his uh, from his uh, apartment and from far away from his workplace and so on. Uh, and, and so we had these bodyguards and in while when he had played tennis, he said in the sauna that he would go to the movies uh, that night. And uh, uh, and so it was clear that he had planned together with his wife to go to the movies that night. And also his wife, Lisbeth, in her workplace uh, in the afternoon said to a friend that they were going to the movies that night. So it was quite clear that they had that plan. but. Still, uh, during uh, at lunchtime, Olof Palme, when coming back from tennis and, and having gone to some clothes store and, and something uh, more, he, he said, told his bodyguards that he didn't need them anymore. And if he needed them, he would call them. And then he knew that he would go to the movies. And as you mentioned, Mats, in the afternoon, during the last interview ever made with him, he said, you never know what is out there, he said meaningly about uh, the outside uh, um, on the streets. In other words, he was uh, he was worried about uh, threats. He was aware of threats, and still he decided to go to the movies in the evening without calling up the bodyguards because they didn't do that. They went out uh, in the night at night and uh, didn't call the bodyguards. They went to the subway, uh, quite unprotected, totally unprotected, and they went to this movie. Theater, which is uh, Biografen Grand, you can see on the map there. They, they came with the subway to the T, uh, Rodmansgat, on the subway station, Rodmansgat, and went to the Biografen Grand, a, the a movie theater, where they saw a film. And in the same um, theater, there was also his, uh, their son, Morton, and his girlfriend. So they saw the same movie, but they didn't sit together because they hadn't uh, reserved tickets together. Then after the movie, around, now we go up to a uh, quarter, 10 minutes past 11 at night. It was uh, February 28th, it was a cold night, windy, black. And they met outside the theater, uh, the couple of Palma and Lisbeth and uh, their son and his girlfriend. And they talked for a little while and it was a suggestion from, from Morton, the son, that they should go together to all of Palmer's and Lisbeth Palmer's apartment, which is, you can see on the way low part of, the, of this map, it says, Mut Gamla Stan, Mr. Longgatan. So the, that direction, roughly uh, one kilometer further down, uh, they lived in, in the old town. So it was suggested that they go together to, to have a cup of tea since they had, hadn't had any possibility to talk, to talk about the film. But uh, it was decided, no, they wouldn't go. Lisbeth Palmer was tired and that resolved the whole thing. So they, they, uh, they went to different directions. Uh, Morton and his girlfriend went uh, up north and Olaf Palmer and uh, Lisbeth went, started walking and that was about uh, a quarter past 11. Uh, and they started walking south, as you can see from the um, black uh, uh, line there. Uh, they walked for uh, roughly 150 meters on, on the west side of the Sveavägen, which is her uh, main road. Uh, and then they crossed that, uh, which was not in the direction to, the, uh, to their ho home, because that was in the other direction. But they crossed the Sviarek. Uh, Lisbeth Palmer afterwards said that she wanted to look into a, a clothes store, clothing store, which was on the other side of the street. And this, uh, after doing that for a, a few seconds, they continued walking down the Sviarek and south, uh, roughly 100 and maybe 50 meters, up until the crossing with the Tunnelgatan. And this is where. He says Mutplatz, and this is where uh, the murder took place. Uh, at, as you mentioned before, roughly 21 minutes past 11. And we will look at a closer picture then of the of the crime site. But this this is the way they they went to the 
to that uh, place and how they happen to get there. And the question is, was this all improvised or was it planned? Was there a plan for them to walk that direction? As I have a feeling and I have, <laughs> there is a lot of information to suggest, I would say, that they were going to a meeting somewhere, a pre-planned meeting in this direction. And what, what, what make you think that they went to a meeting? What, what was the indications of that? First of all, as I mentioned, they didn't have any bodyguards. It would have been absolutely natural for them at that time of night uh, uh, to have bodyguards to protect them. Uh, and this was also according to what was uh, decided with the uh, secret service that uh, they should have, or the pilot should have bodyguards when he walked around like that. Also that they split up from the son and uh, his girlfriend instead of going together to have tea. Also that they walked in a direction which is not towards their home, but uh, they crossed the street uh, to, to the other side of the street. Uh, and also the last steps, and this, my book is about the last steps of Olof Palme and Lisbeth Palme. The, last, the direction of the last steps were into, seemed to be rather into the Tunnelgatan. That is away from the normal the way they would have taken if they were going home. So I feel it's quite probable uh, that they had a plan to see someone, to do something uh, when leaving the, the movie theater and they had to do it on their own. They didn't want any, uh, any observation from the secret service. Uh, they wanted to do that quite uh, unobserved. It was a secret, I, I can imagine that they had a secret meeting Possibly it was connected with um, uh, the trip to Moscow, which Palma had planned and which was due to take place in April, just uh, five, five, six weeks after the, the, uh, this date. Uh, that so what, what, what was this, the, this trip? There was a lot of uh, the um, high militaries that were concerned about this trip. And what, what were the last or, or the worst? Uh, fears around this trip and what what were they thinking because i mean that that uh, a prime minister goes to moscow and or have a meeting it's 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 not unusual or it's not unusual but it was very controversial uh, as i said there were circles or groups in sweden in the military in the secret service and we know that for sure uh, that suspected palma of uh, uh, having illegitimate contacts and illegitimate plans with the russians some suspected him of uh, having the idea of uh, coming up with proposition proposals to the Russians, which were very damaging to the West. One such idea that he had actually brought forward was to create a neutral or a, a nuclear free zone in the Nordic countries. Uh, in other words, no nuclear weapons in Scandinavia and in, in the Nordic countries. Uh, this was known to, to, uh, to be an idea that uh, Olaf Palme had. And this, this would have been very damaging to the Western NATO strategy because it would have forced Na Norway and Denmark to leave NATO and would uh, seriously have weakened uh, the Western strategy and the NATO strategy. So it, it was really risky uh, for them and, and uh, was highly controversial. Uh, and yeah. so if Palmer had actually plans of that nature, there would be reason for him to have pre-meetings uh, in advance, possibly with envoys from uh, Moscow to prepare for this meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev had been elected leader of the Communist Party in, in, in the Soviet Union the year before, and this was to be the first meeting between Palme and Gorbachev. Many, people, many of Palme's critics in, in Sweden and in, uh, in the West were fearful that uh, uh, what he would what he would uh, bring up when meeting uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. So, so can I just quickly ask then? So, so, so Lars, are you saying that? Um, <clears throat> and I agree that the, the walk uh, is not the shortest uh, route home on a cold night. And 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 anyone who has lived in the far north know what a cold night means. But but uh, are, are you saying that 
you think they had a meeting or is there any evidence and, and with whom would they meet? Would they meet with uh, someone opposed to the plan or, or in favor of the proposal? Uh, well, my book, uh, in my book, I uh, put forward the, uh, uh, the thought, I would say, that uh, the Secret Service in Sweden, SEPO, uh, were involved in the planning of the assassination. Because just for this reason that they were fearful of what Palmer was going to do with Russians. And this, uh, they would have the motive and all the abilities and so on. We can come back to that. Uh, but uh, I, I believe that uh, those who believe that he would uh, had such a meeting in, in, uh, in his thought that he was going to, they would uh, organize some kind of surveillance of him, secret surveillance. You know, but there were a number of witnesses, uh, and they came up very soon after the murder, of witnesses, witnesses seeing men with walkie-talkies. Uh, like uh, mobile phones, but there were no cellular or mobile phones at the time. When you saw someone speak like this, it was a walkie-talkie, actually. Must have been. And there were men with walkie-talkies seen close to Palmer's, uh, uh, and all Lisbeth Palmer's, uh, uh, where they were walking to the, to the cinema and towards the crime scene. And so this is an indication that there was some kind of activity around the couple. And to me, it's very logical that uh, the Secret Service, SEPO, uh, imagining that Palmer was doing something harmful or had planning some kind of meeting, secret meeting that could be of interest to, to, to um, make a surveillance of, that they were there and looked at it. The, the, this walkie-talkie that that came up very early in the I mean I, I I don't know if it was already in the I think it was already in the 80s it was all over the news and everybody knew about it. What has the inv investigators said and found out about that actually? Because there is obviously some someone was out there with walkie-talkies, which was unusual at the time that that you were. They were never interested. This is so strange because in the in the first thirty years after the murder. There was no interest for what it, walkie-talkie witnesses at all. Uh, the the idea, strange. the idea was that there was a lone assassin, and this was a theory that has been predominant all through these years. A lone assassin, and if only one of these witness accounts of, of a walkie-talkie is true and relevant, it proves that it wasn't a lone assassin. It must have been somebody else on the other end of of, of, of this communication. So they were, uh, believe it or not, but they were not interested in the walkie-talkies. Uh, only in the past three or four or five years, they have shown an interest in these uh, in these witness accounts. And now, after what happened last summer, uh, yeah, last summer in June, when the investigation was cancelled, so to speak, uh, and turned uh, and uh, uh, finalized, a lot of material has been um, declassified. And so we know now what the witness accounts look like about the walkie-talkies, and they are very clear. I must say, but very. Uh, uh, it, it, it seems that they are very relevant. Uh, I, I can say, and um, also there has been uh, declassified a report from the Secret Service itself from '87, where they said that it seems to be that. Olof Palme was put under surveillance the day before the murder and on the day of the murder all the way up till, till the, the murder itself, till the assassination. In other words, it was known that there was this surveillance, but the investigators never bothered to look into it. So we know, we still don't know who they were. Uh, this is one of the many mysteries of, of the Palme investigation that they they uh, looked away from all these indications of if you so if you want a conspiracy they didn't believe in it they believed in one lone assassin but uh, would it be possible if we go back to the crime scene and and uh, if, if you describe a little bit how the the murder happened uh, what the witnesses saw and and where the murder uh, where he ended up or where they saw him running uh, 
Mm. Before this book came out, you would have a hundred percent for uh, the first bullet killing your father, yes, certainly, because this seems to be the natural thing. That if you want to kill Olof Palme and you shoot also aim at his wife, you would first shoot Olof Palme and then aim at his wife. Actually, in the book, I prove, I don't think it's a theory, I think I prove that uh, the first bullet went towards Lisbeth Palme, the wife, and the second bullet killed Olof Palme. And why would anyone do that who wants to? Most likely he wants to kill the prime minister and, and not his wife. Why would he shoot at his wife first? Exactly. You have to tell us that. Uh. This, this is why it is so uh, extraordinary. If, when, when seeing that this must be the case, be, which I believe, strongly believe, you have to think about the motive of the murder. What was his motive? What was his objective when he was, went up to the, uh, to the couple and fired his two shots? Uh, who would start by firing at the wife and then at Palma? That must mean something. Unless you believe it was just by mistake that the, the first bullet just went off. Maybe I should explain that the, the, um, the bullet that hit Lisbeth Palme, which I say was the first one, it didn't really, it only just touched her because it went through her, the back of her coat, on the back of her coat, on, on her back, touched her skin, but di didn't all, almost didn't give any trace at all, just a small scar extremely close to the skin, but she was extremely lucky to not be hurt. Whereas the bullet that killed Olaf Palme, which I say was a second bullet, it went 100% perfect into his spine and led immediately to his death. So these two uh, shots were fired within two, I would say two, two and a half seconds. It was extremely well done by the, <laughs> well done by, by the uh, perpetrator. Uh, to place the second shot so quickly after the first one, so exactly into Olof Palme. I will describe later, this is very important because in the book, I describe the, how the, the action of the, of the perpetrator, and it tells a lot, as I see it, what kind of person he was. He was not a drug addict, mm -hmm. uh, of an alcoholic, like the first suspect that was convicted in 1988, Christa Pettersson, and then freed but still being the, the prime suspect for 20 more years. And he was not a graphic designer like this <laughs> uh, man who was this summer mentioned or was suspected as, as, as a murderer. Through all these years, Lisbeth Palmer's account of what happened has been taken for granted. And even if witnesses, other witnesses said otherwise or gave another description of what happened, the investigators have believed her and she has, so to speak, she has uh, trumped everybody else. She, there was no question that she was telling the truth and the full truth. And this, of course, I feel very, it must be very pro unprofessional to give all credibility to one witness, regardless of she's being the widow of, of, of the, the victim, of course. And uh, it was very a tragical thing to her. What happened was that as Lisbeth and Olof Palme came walking towards this place, uh, the murder, the crime site, the, the crossing with Tunnelgatan. Uh, three independent of each other, independent witnesses afterwards said that they were had a contact. One witness was walking behind uh, Olof Palme, Lisbeth Palme, and the perpetrator, and he said he was just five meters behind. Anders B, we can call it Anders B. And he said already a few hours afterwards when he was questioned by the police that he saw that they were walking at least five meters together in company, as a company, talking, having a good time as it seemed together, he said. And all of a sudden, quite surprisingly, one shot, the man to the left shot the person in the middle and then disappeared, a shot uh, twice, twice uh, and then disappeared. Uh, and uh, another witness sitting uh, a bit further away in a car said that she saw the three persons, the murderer and the couple coming towards the crime site as a company, in company with each other. 
A third witness, a taxi driver, who happened to be standing for red light, just a few, yeah. You have uh, number one there. You have the crossing there between Sveavägen and Tunnelgatan. It says Mogplatsen there with, a, with, a, with an arrow. And then you have on top of that number one, Anders B, which is a witness who walked just a few meters behind and said that they were walking together for at least five meters, talking, have a good time, and, and, and suddenly uh, one of them shot, fired shots. Uh, the other witness was number four, who was sitting in a car uh, facing northwards, Cecilia A. She saw also these three people coming, walking towards the crime site, Mokplatsen, as a, in company, as a company, as she, uh, as she saw it. The th next one is number two up to the left, Anders D. He was a taxi driver. And he was standing there for red light and he looked to his left and he saw three people standing there talking to each other, at least standing and looking at each other, facing each other, a couple and a man. Uh, and and uh, so he's, he observed this just a short while before the, the uh, murder took place. Three independent witnesses saying that there was a contact between them. And this would mean, of course, that Lisbeth Palmer uh, would know that they had had a contact with the murder before the, before the assassination. And she said, no, nothing like that happened. We walked, we came walking uh, along the pavement, all of Palmer and herself, arm in arm, quite unknowingly, and all of a sudden, un unexpectedly, she heard the bangs and, uh, and the, the shots. And uh, when she turned around, the perpetrator fled into the tunnel garden. She had not, no contact, no knowledge of his presence before that. So one would expect that the investigators would put her in front of the other people's testimony and question her. How come that they say this and they say that? But they didn't. She was never confronted with their, uh, as far as we know. It, it, it doesn't show from any, any interrogation with Lisbeth Palmer that she was confronted with these other testimonies. Now, the thing which is very peculiar about Lisbeth Palmer is that she didn't allow the police, the investigators, to tape the interrogations with her. All other witnesses are taped and recorded, documented, as they should be. And also a, quite a, a, maybe a little bit stronger position because she had been attacked herself by this shot, the first shot. So she was also a victim of this crime. Mm. And in that position, she has somewhat stronger rights towards the investigators. Than, and also, for instance, in court, she doesn't have to give an oath. Uh, that, uh, she, she, she doesn't have to promise to tell the truth. Uh, since she was herself a victim. So this had some importance. Also, all other witnesses that were asked by the police agreed to participate in a reconstruction of what happened on the place. So the police took them there and they showed how they had been standing and what they had seen and so on. She didn't. She didn't participate in any reconstruction. So this witness, which was the most uncooperative witness of all, didn't want to be taped, didn't to take part in a reconstruction, was given the fullest credibility by the police, even when other witnesses give another uh, account of what had happened. This is totally inconsistent. And, um, and this has continued all over the years until the last minute now this year when it was between brackets sold. Yes, she died a few years ago, a couple of years ago, but I know that uh, four or five years ago, the police again wanted to question her. She didn't uh, want to do that. So they didn't no. get uh, talk to her. The, the second part of my book is about the Secret Service, because I think, as I said before, the Secret Service may very well have been involved. They had information about Olof Palmer. It was revealed after the murder that a group within the Secret Service, within the staff, secretly collected information about Olof Palme 
without possibly the consent of the leadership or the leaders of the Secret Service. They did it maybe on their own, but they collected information about Palmer because they saw him as unreliable. They were very, very uh, critical to, to Palmer. And so they collected information and they could get all kinds of information, of course. Okay. So what I can see as one possible explanation for Lisbeth Palmer not feeling free to tell what happened is that she was afraid that if she gave any uh, information that pointed towards the Secret Service, information would leak out about all of but there's so many more questions than answers, unfortunately. But it, it, it's fascinating uh, uh, as well. So uh, thank thank you so much, uh, Lars Bornes, for taking time. I think uh, we, we could uh, sit here for hours and discuss this. It's, uh, it's fascinating. And uh, thanks, Lars Johansson, for uh, being with us. It was fascinating to be with you. Yeah. Thank you all. I have to do this again. Thank you, everyone, and have a great first advent. Uh...